where you guys are interacting. And it comes back, and you're front and center once again. Yeah, this thing's pretty cool. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So, good afternoon. Um, we're going to ask uh, everyone to take their seats. And um, I'm going to apologize in advance because earlier when I made my um, thank yous and introductions, it's my understanding that those in virtual land couldn't hear me. So I promise not to do the same speech at length, but you are going to be um, you are going to hear the same thing a little bit. Uh, again, my name is Karen Freeman Wilson, President and CEO of the Chicago Urban League, and we're excited to relaunch next one. One thing that I did not say earlier is that the next one in its original form was the brainchild of one of my predecessors, Cheryl Jackson. And so I just want everyone here and everyone virtually to join me in giving Cheryl Jackson gratitude and love for her vision and for her participation in the video. Um, I took some time and read the original proclamation for June 10th. Because today is Juneteenth. Happy Juneteenth, everybody. Happy Juneteenth. And the original proclamation said this. The people of Texas are informed that in accordance with a proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of personal rights, and rights of property between former masters and slaves and the connection heretofore existing between them becomes that between employer and hired labor. The freedmen are advised to remain quiet at their present homes. Y'all know that was on the plantation, right? And work for wages. They are informed that they will not be allowed to collect at military posts and that they will not be supported in idleness, either here, there, or elsewhere. And when we talked about it earlier, I talked about the fact that Juneteenth is uh, a commemoration of that Declaration of Freedom in Texas. And that was read at Galveston, but it's also an opportunity for us to acknowledge that the Emancipation Proclamation had been given or made in 1863, two years earlier, by President Lincoln. And it's evidence of how elusive freedom can be. And quite frankly, that's why the Urban League exists to really strive for freedom, equity, equality for Black people. And that really is why we thought it was so important to relaunch next one and to do it on June 10th. In doing that, we certainly didn't do it alone. And um, we want to acknowledge our former director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, Jason Johnson, who is attending virtually, 
uh, and who has moved on to another opportunity. But we also want to acknowledge our current director of the Center for Entrepreneurship, Kevin Davenport, who's here with us today. We also want to acknowledge the next one, Queen Sharon McVeigh, Adasa Hickman, and Cameron Hughes, who are all here and who have been working extremely hard, as well as our development team, Erskine Fouch and James Mazier, and our external affairs team, uh, Calmetta Coleman and Quentin Arthur. Together, this team has come together to bring you Next One today. But the most important aspect of Next One are you, our participants. And we are so grateful that you have joined us today. My final two thank yous uh, come to a group of folks without whom this relaunch would not have been possible. The first group is our sponsors. And we are very, very fortunate to have been sponsored by AT&T, Boeing, BMO Harris, Fifth Third, and McGrath Auto Group. I also want to thank the next one advisory group. And this group has been meeting um, in many ways uh, monthly, but often more than once a month throughout our time. And they are Alyssa Berman Cutler, Avis LaBelle, LaBelle, Betsy Ziegler, Rawls Fight, and a special shout out to Rawls Fight and the Lafayana team that helped us get to launch, Haven Allen, Ken Esco, Tyrone Studemeyer, one of our board members, Bernice Billups, Nicole Johnson Scales, Shannon McGee, Pamela Randall, Michelle Rogers, and Cheryl Jackson. Joyce Johnson Miller, Elaine Granger, and B.R. Lane. If I have omitted anyone, please count it to my head and not my heart. Um, one of the things that the Urban League has been involved in is a group called Two Thirds United. And this group is representative of organizations that support, advocate for the Black and Brown community in the city of Chicago. And it really is evidence that together we make uh, two thirds of this population. And the leaders of those organizations meet um, almost on a monthly basis, and we support each other. And so we were so honored uh, when Rick Estrada of Metropolitan Family Services indicated that he wanted to join us today. And so please uh, join me in welcoming to the virtual podium uh, Rick Estrada, who's the president and CEO of Metropolitan Family Service to bring you greetings at this time. Well, uh, Karen, it is an honor to join you and the Urban League in welcoming all of you to this important commemoration of Juneteenth, our newest national holiday. And congratulations also to the next one lead on entrepreneurs and welcome to all today's guests. Let me begin with a quote from the Honorable Sandra Day O'Connor, our former Associate Justice of the Supreme Court on the importance of the Constitution. What makes the Constitution worthy of our commitment? First and foremost, the answer is our 
Yeah. It is quite simple, the most powerful vision of freedom ever expressed. It's also the world's shortest and the oldest national neither so rigid as neither so rigid nor so malleable as to be devoid of meaning. Our constitution has been an inspiration that changed the trajectory of world history for the perpetual benefit of humankind. What was revolutionary when it was written and what continues to inspire the world today is that the constitution put governance in the hands of the people, we the people. However, the vision and promise of the constitution was not fully realized as you know, because it did not provide freedom for all or voting rights for half of its citizens. We needed amendments to do that. We know that the Emancipation Proclamation became effective on January 1, 1963, yet it was not until June 19, 1865, that an announcement by the Union Army proclaimed freedom from slavery in Texas. Delaware and Kentucky took even longer. So what does that have to do with Latinx and other Americans? I would say, everything. One of the best things that has come out of this challenging pandemic period is that many people have decided that the status quo is no longer sufficient. We are at another inflection point in our history, and we have an opportunity to supercharge social justice efforts to generate change. Racism, sexism, and the many other isms are being challenged with a new intensity and I'm glad to say that the Latinx community has and will always be an ally in these movements. Benito Juarez, the America's first indigenous head of state as president of Mexico has a quote that continues to be remembered across Latin America and across the world. It goes like this, entre los individuos como entre las naciones, el respeto al derecho ajeno es la paz. Meaning, among individuals, as among nations, respect for the rights of others is peace. Sound familiar? No justice, no peace. Juarez was a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln. In fact, they exchanged letters and spoke about freedom and equality. Our past and our future will always be intertwined. As Dr. King said, we are intertwined in a single garment of destiny. We must and we'll work together toward justice. I hope you enjoyed today's wonderful program and thanks again to Karen and the Urban League. And thank you so much for your partnership. At this time, we are going to welcome back to the podium our fearless leader, Karen McDay. another exciting part of our uh, program. Guess what? We get to hear from our alumni. Okay. So uh, I'm going to take an alumni is going to share their experiences, best, best practices, or insights with regards to their experience in the uh, next month's program. We're going to have a panel of moderators. And let me introduce our moderator. Our moderator is here, right? Yeah, she's online. She's online. She's online. Okay, so let me introduce. Um, hello, Jean. <laughs> let me introduce Jean Farrell. She is a seven-time award-winning television host, reporter, radio personality, speaker, voiceover artist, and currently on B103 and R Radio. Now, there you hear from a bio that she's going to be a book publisher as well. So let me, let me throw that in. So we're very privileged to have her monitor this. So now I'm going to turn it over to uh, Jean Carroll. Thank you so much. I hope you can hear me just fine. I'm sorry I couldn't make it there in person, but I'm honored to be here once again with the Chicago Urban League. Happy Juneteenth to each and every one of you. Um, 
And uh, thank God we've all made it to this point, right? And what a great thing that we are celebrating today, uh, not just Juneteenth, but also the empowerment that's behind it. Uh, so first off, uh, we'd like to give you a little bit of background on Next One. Uh, the Chicago Urban League started Next One back in 2007 with the goal of building the next generation of Black business leaders. Uh, it's a nine-month program providing training and support to help businesses that are already established, Black-owned businesses that are already established to, to scale and grow. And we, and anybody who's an entrepreneur knows that that scale part is always the thing, but it is also the way that we build generational wealth and the way that we are able to have businesses that, that last. Uh, from 2007 to 2011, Next One served more than 60 Black business owners. And after a 10 year hiatus, Next One is back. Uh, and the Chicago Urban League is doing this to close the wealth gap between black, black and white Chicagoans because we still see that gap persisting. And one of the most promising avenues to do that is through black owned businesses. So as the 2021-22 cohort of Next One businesses begin their nine month journey, we have three Next One alumni who've agreed to share some of their experiences from participating in the program. So Right now, I'd like to have each one of the panelists uh, introduce themselves. Tell us a little bit about your business and what year you participated in Next One. First, uh, Jimmy Akintande. Hi, Jimmy. Hi. Hi. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Jimmy Akintande. I'm the president of the and I believe I was in the very first next one program. Uh, what is it? I look much younger than that. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, and it was a great program. Right now, I think we're all contractors, uh, actually located in Chicago, but we also have offices in the South. Uh, about four years ago, we were in the office in the South. So we're actually in uh, Atlanta. Does about uh, 95 million on kind of numbers in the year in construction uh, with over 100 people that both states, regionally and government companies going in Chicago. One of the things I'm very excited about is naming the community in Chicago. And we were talking about a great deal like today and sharing my experiences and how the program really helped me in terms of how we started thinking about our business. Thank you so much, Jimmy. We'll have uh, an introduction next from Amy. Hi, Amy Hillier. Can you tell us a little bit about the Hillier Group and the Comfort Cake Company and when you were part of Next One? Yeah, hi, Jimmy. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Um, it's really fun to be here. It's an honor to be here. I was part of the class in 2009. And so going back to when they asked me to be a part I had to go to the vision as well. Just wow, well, that was a long time ago. Um, but it really still is close to my heart. I'm still close to me and my classmates, and, and um, it's great to be here with one of them. Um, it was a great program. Um, it was really uh, aligned with the Comfort Cake Company when I was part of Next One, and the Comfort Cake Company is a food business that made pound cake after my own recipe. Um, because pound cake was my favorite dessert. And so it was about how to scale the comfort cake company. And at the time, we were um, doing business with the Chicago Public Schools. But our first um, client was United Airlines. And so it was really, you know, getting my business um, scaled from United Airlines and then we go into more retail um, accounts um, after doing business in the food service with Chicago Public Schools. And then we went into Home Shopping Network, we um, did some business via Pest with McDonald's, um, and then it was the question of do I open up a plant and manufacture myself because we were doing contract manufacturing. And since that time, um, we did a lot of different things, but now the business is totally different. We have pivoted to being an intellectual property um, licensing company because we had to make the decision whether we wanted to own a plant or not. And I decided that owning a plant is not the pathway for the company uh, because we 
be as a people don't understand how valuable some of our intellectual property is. And that was something that we studied a lot um, as part of next one. So I decided to hold on to all of my intellectual trademarks, my recipes, and we have this outstanding sugar substitute. So I decided to hold on to those and license them to the food industry, which is what we're doing now. The Zillia Group, which I've always had um, since 1994, is a marketing, marketing consulting firm that really helps major corporations penetrate the multicultural marketing space. And so we've always had that, and that's been doing well in talking to multicultural corporations and also working with small entrepreneurs who want to grow their businesses as well. And then the third thing that I do is that I'm a writer and an author. Um, I have two books out, one is Catholic Tradition, How to Find Your Gifts, Be Sincere, and Build Your Dreams, which Michelle Obama endorsed. And then my next book, which is coming out next Tuesday, it's on pre sale now. Give us one to set. Congratulations, Amy. Thank you so much for sharing. Next on our panel, Kamal Murray. Can you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about your uh, business and uh, when you were part of Next One? Hey, everybody. I was a part of the 2011 class of Next One. I think that's not just bad. Uh, but I'm the founder of the Excellence Education Foundation, which at the time was just uh, Fall through doing the lessons in the summertime, I was done by fall. Uh, and then, you know, we got the opportunity to uh, operate year round, 47 street locations, 47 Lake Park. And then, um, you know, we were sort of forced to go up and land and have a chance to build it. So we tried to support those black houses, trying to build our own space. And we successfully did that in 2017. We got the first two million out of the facility to be built in Lower Mount Ditto. First in the world to be built by a black person. Uh, and I was a nation's largest, uh, and I was six organizations for more black kids in college than our grass foundation, which we have their nine and three out of the other. So, um, but the next one, like really have my still focus on the next one culture and trend. Um, and, you know, it really forced me at the time to sort of work on my business. Like, we used to be the HR and payroll, all the other stuff that you can really sit down and like say, let's move this people. I think the deadline in that new program helped me to sit down and have a vision plan for the plan for the future, which at the time it would be the plan for the future or be something state. Uh, so without the next one, I'm not sure I, I held myself accountable. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Oh, y'all give, y'all make sure you. I'm all about the uh, the applause. Uh, thank you so much, Kamal. And finally, Last but not least, I'd like to introduce uh, JT Stinnett. Can you introduce yourself? Tell us a little bit about your business and when you were part of Next One. Absolutely. So I'm JT Stinnett. I am uh, a part of the cohort with Amy um, in 2008 or not. At the time, President Obama was just elected. So I remember doing um, the activities and going to the inauguration, which was an exciting time. But at the same time, uh, the economy was not perfect. And myself, my husband, and my best friend had a construction company. So what Next One helped us to do was to pivot. Um, we were doing great construction, and that was all the way uh, So um, our coaches helped us to become lead AP and kind of Set an industry standard. We developed a program called Great Urbanism, um, which was featured in the Museum of Science and Industry and later was um, introduced to the city of Gary. It was wonderful to be working with uh, then Mayor Kim and now President Kim and you see how the continuum of life has. Right? Um, what I will say was a wonderful um, takeaway from next month was the ability to learn how to stay in the game. And that was very important going through the recession. So while we had a great great construction business at that time, now I run three businesses, one of which was a pivot. Um, we stayed in the business of creating green jobs, and I created um, a green call center for small business. 
also have a travel uh, company um, and a cannabis. So three different businesses, serial entrepreneur, and I would say next one helped me to um, have the wings to do that, to have the confidence to do that, um, and the toolkit to do that. So I remember doing the fourth work at Northwestern, and one of the um, professors talking about your best alternative to a negotiated agreement um, in negotiation. And that has informed some of the work that I've done as general counsel for the travel company. So what I want to encourage you to be present. We as businesses, a lot of times we're doing so many different things to come out point that we're not engaged. We're, we're just moving towards the future. Um, but I remember that lesson from um, the Northwestern professor that's guided me in negotiation to the future. So this is a wonderful asset. I'm happy to be back and to give back. I served on the advisory board um, and just excited to meet each and every one. Thank you so much, JT. We appreciate it. Um, I'm getting a note from our production team that uh, we, we want the panelists to be closer to the camera, if at all possible. Um, I don't know, I, because I'm physically not there, I will ask you guys to manage that as best you can. Um, and because I think we want to make sure that this is the best experience for those who are not able to attend in person uh, as well as virtually. So thanks to everyone for your patience as we uh, get our panelists a little bit closer so we can see their faces better. And I can too. And it's so lovely to see you, although I know what most of you look like already. It's always nice to see people. Um, in every sense of the word. And we're also getting some notes through our chat here for people who are online saying congratulations on the launch. And uh, somebody also said, Kamal, that there was a huge, it was uh, Brawl said, there's a huge turnout at the tennis facility today when he went to go get Duncan. So there you go. All right, let's start off with um, the thing that's wonderful about all your introductions is that you gave us some really great information uh, for the next class of cohorts and people who are thinking about applying for next one in the future. Um, what were you looking for when you originally applied? What were you looking for in the experience of next one? And then what was the most valuable thing? Did you get that or something unexpected? And you, all of you touched on it in some way. Um, and let's start with you, Kamal, since you uh, are the most recent graduate of, of the next one program. What were you looking for? And what did you find to be the most valuable thing uh, that came out of your next one experience? Uh, so I think at the time I was just looking for some free consulting, you know, you know smart people and you know look at your business and um, I was hoping they put together a slide deck for me and budget for me, which they didn't do, right? And I was like, oh shit, I thought you know, I'm going to hand you what I do and y'all can make it nice and self check and pre design, you know, that wasn't that, but it was, uh, you know, sort of coaching me on how to do this, right? Or holding me accountable to what you've done. Uh, so I was really looking for just some free consulting. Um, and, you know, out of that, I think that um, I got, I refined my methods. You know, because I was, it really couldn't help me as much because they didn't know tennis, they didn't know nothing about tennis, they didn't know who Taylor Townsend was or Paul Stevens was. Nobody knew who that was. So I was having to educate folks on sort of, you know, why I exist, why Taylor is it's a nonprofit. So I don't make money like that. But uh, you know, why was I doing it? And through explaining it to people who were, you know, tennis novices, it helped me develop, you know, frameworks. I'm looking at it, I'm like, wow, what's on here? You know, this is what you're doing. You got to come with a better message because it's not clear, right? So I learned how to clarify my message. You know, if I'm going to build tennis in the hood, I need to actually be real clear on why we're doing it. So I thought they did, you know, like free consulting. Then I think they helped me to clarify that. Does anyone have anything else to add to that? Uh, JT or or uh, Jimmy or Amy? I, I would say I was coming for a free consultant. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was coming for a free um, to kind of understand our business better and understand our masterpiece. And we got so much more than what we bargained for. 
um, the peer group was excellent to be among other entrepreneurs and to understand that your flight is not just unique to you. Sometimes we operate in a bubble. The entrepreneurs have similarities. It is great to be able to be in communication with others and understand that. Um, illumination is also a great thing. To get exposure, your business to get exposure. Um, and then from that, additional resources to help you grow. Um, so those are all great takeaways. Much better than what we were doing. And well, I would build on that. Okay, absolutely, Amy. Go ahead. One of the things that intrigued me was the fact that we were established on This was one of the only programs that was available for established entrepreneurs. There are a lot of startup programs, but this was for established entrepreneurs. So our need was different from if we were a startup. And that was something that was, you know, out the box. It was like, no, you have to be established. And then what they taught us and what they offered us was resources that were for us at our level. And that was really, really good, number one. And number two was the peer group um, learning and what we could learn from our peers who were also established. And number three were the resources. I mean, the people that they exposed us to were high caliber resources um, from the, the professors that they took us to at Northwestern um, were just amazing. And, you know, these were people who were at the top of their game, which was helpful for us to raise the hours. I think I'll second exactly what Amy just mentioned. You know, when we, when I joined, we had been in business for five years. So, so at that stage, we're still trying to consider what are we doing, how are we doing it, you know, if we know what we're doing or not. And there's something about coming to a program with all the businesses around and you realize that they're not the only ones with the same problem. Uh, and, and, and as long as you allow yourself to open up to the people around you to share some of their concerns and to listen to some of their challenges, uh, you, you just, you, it's like the gift that keeps giving them. You got the, you know, you got the, I remember one of the marketing classes at, at North, you know, Northwestern. And they literally give you a charge and you talk about stuff. And on Monday, you stop working on that right away. Right? You got a you got a client calling you and you leave your note. <laughs> and uh that's that is real smart. <laughs> right? And you know what? <laughs> the thing I find really interesting about the, the especially your last two comments uh but the the thread that goes through all of this because i've experienced i experienced this too and i didn't anticipate it is that a lot of times you do feel like you're by yourself when you're an entrepreneur when you're just starting out and having a group of people around who understand what your particular challenges are can be the thing that keeps you from saying forget this and you know going back into corporate sector or whatever you were doing before and actually persisting and building something that is all yours um, one of the things that I want to talk to you that you've already like kind of, especially dovetailing off of what you just talked about, Jimmy, is how you apply what you learn, uh, from next one to your business. You gave a great example of, you know, learning something one day and then the next Monday you're right on it. Um, what are some, some other specific examples from, from others, Amy, do you have something to add to that? Yes, I think that you know he had talked about it in terms of the negotiation skills. The negotiation professor is one of the uh, most renowned negotiation experts in the country. I still have my notes from way back then, and I pull them out when I'm negotiating on a number of different things because you know negotiation skills are uh, both soft skills and hard skills, and you know you really have to know what you're asking for before you get in the room. But she also said, know what they need before they get in the room. And that's very important because sometimes when you negotiate, you only think about what you want. And that's not the way to have a win-win. And so I think that, that that particular course was excellent. Um, Steve Rogers' finance course was excellent, you know, in terms of understanding finance. I'm a marketing person, but I also, you know, make sure that I, I'm the CMO of my company, which is the chief money officer too. You know, you got to know where your money is always. And so that was reinforced. Um, and it's really just understanding how you break the business down 
from just the idea and the excitement of having your business, but you got to break it down so you know all the key parts, and that's what Next One did a lot of, you know, for us all. Um, so that that was important. To me. I love that. JT or Kamal, do you guys have anything to add to this? Um, uh, no, I think the professor Ryder's class was a high one. I'm going to wake up like, <laughs> go. Um, so the Northwestern classes were, were very good. Um, you know, they were like case studies in terms of, uh, and I think those were pretty helpful. Um, I think it was also, you know, during those classes, as you start to, you know, understand, hey, I have HR issues, and so does the screen print business, and so does the, you know, the, the construction business, right? So you start to not feel so bad about the situation. Um, and, uh, you know, the accounting issue. And then, you know, I think one of the things in class is not understanding what your time is worth and what's the value. So at the time, I probably wasn't making my fee, right, or paychecks or whatever. And it was like, you know, I'm tired of you know, so, um, you know, and then of course, it's the math was one, every quarter, that kind of thing. So I think that that also has been saying, you know, your time is worth X amount of dollars, and you can pay 80, 80, 88 bucks at your payroll, and you're going to do it. That's all right. Right. And so, you know, I thought that was also uh, helpful. Yeah, it does help to prioritize, right? Oh, it's, it's amazing. But one of the other aspects is your urban needs back. So at the time, Gus Tucker was uh, one of the key uh, staff members, and I can remember something that Gus said to us, and it was everything is evaluated. And I never thought about things in that way, but he was like every meeting, every encounter, every dinner is evaluated. And so I talked to my staff about that. Um, take that practice into meetings and interactions. Everyone's always looking, you're always representing your business, no matter what the environment or what you're doing. And so, as uh, Amy said, you're the chief money and the chief marketing officer for your business, no matter what you're doing, if you're on vacation or if you're sitting up or playing golf or if you're sitting across at a negotiation. That was a great lesson and that came from Urban League staff. As um, Kevin mentioned, use the entrepreneurship center and resources that they have available there and continue to use them nine months and beyond. Um, I would encourage you. Right. Well, and, and one of the things, I'm sorry. Oh, I'll have you read it. In the intro video that the lead did in the luncheon uh, in that year that we were in the promo, uh, they did a, they have a five second, I'm going to have a clip on from our company, there's five seconds. And in this big auditorium, Enterprise uh, rent a car, I was be in the room. And I literally got a call the next day. Well, I mean, it, was, it was like a Thursday, I got a call the next day. And, uh, you guys are, hey, you know, I saw your hard hat on the on the screen. You know, you guys uh, you know, want to look at looking at some work for us. And I was like, I'll go. And I ran over there. We did a couple of small grants before, and we built all the large projects that we had. In the city. Uh, we built the first uh, deep car rental facility, consolidated uh, consolidated rental facility in the nation. Uh, as a result of that introduction, so you never know what the exposure will be. And it wasn't our exposure, it was the league's exposure. Highlighted my business. Just be ready. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes they say when you uh when you pray for something, be sure you're ready for the answer. Um so <laughs> The thing that I found interesting, I actually, especially with you, Amy, and you, JT, um, is, and, is how you've taken your entrepreneurship into other areas. How did your business and, and or your business model change and evolve uh, as you completed the program? And was it something that was in um, what you learned in the program that, that, that gave you the idea or, or the impetus to uh, expand and change that? Because you know, our, our businesses sometimes get a life of their own and morph into what they want to be. 
And you sometimes, at least that's been my experience, and you just kind of follow it in that direction because your customers let you know for sure. So uh, JT, we'll start with you um, because you had multiple businesses that you talked about. Was that always part of the plan or the next one help you? No, it was definitely not part of the plan. We thought we would be a green construction company forever. And then 2008 happened. And the uh, bottom fell out of the market. And so I think uh, now we have hope from the pandemic and the need to adjust and to pivot and uh, to be fluid. Um, and I think that lesson did come from next one and from the resources that we had, um, having to do the coursework and the preparation, diving into your numbers and understanding if it doesn't make money, it doesn't make sense. So focusing your business on things that are revenue generating. Um, and we only have so much time in the So like the mom said, you know, diversify. I don't have to do payroll. It's just going to take too much of my time. And that's not added to my bottom line in the right way. And so I think those lessons did come from the program. So for me, it was, you know, both personal and professional because around 2007, my father was really ill and was getting worse. And then the recession hit. And then also, um, you know, I love Michelle Obama, but then she had decided that, you know, the kids needed to have less dessert at the school. You know, with her program. And I'm like, well, I'm serving six weeks servings of pound cake a year. And I'm like, oh, okay. And so that totally changed my business when they started reducing the number of desserts in the school. That changed my business entirely. And I had to really change what I was serving from pound cake to um, healthy pizza. Now I had I held the volume in the business, but the profits were cut in half. And so that really changed how my business was, how my business model was going. So we kept the volume, but you know, I had to really scramble to try to keep the profits up. And so it was like, okay, what do you do now? And then I had the retail business and that was going okay. But you know, when your profits change, you have to really say, okay, now what kind of business do you want? And that's when I started looking at if I had a plant, my profits would change because I would have more money coming directly from me as the manufacturer versus paying it to a project manufacturer. But that had different um, permutations and challenges as well that I did not want to take on. So I had to really just take a step back and make some decisions. And because of what the challenges were, I also had to, you know, take a job to make sure that my family was okay. Because I had two children um, who were going to college, and I had to make sure that they were alright. So, you know, things happen for a reason. I was then approached by Linda Johnson Wright to uh, become the president of Fashion Fair Cosmetics, you know, down the road. And so she said, I know you have a food business, but would you consider running Fashion Fair? And so my daughter, who was involved with Next One with me, who and she was my office manager at the time, and if you look at the pictures from Next One, you'll see my daughter and myself. And she said, Mom, I'll keep running that uh, comfort cake go ahead and do fashion care and that's exactly what happened because she knew about next one she was with me with next one so she said i can do that and so she did that while i ran fashion care but then i had to make the decision of how we were going to continue on with comfort care which by the way it sounds so good it feels like a hug <laughs> <laughs> okay but she wrote that had by my daughter when she was 14 years old and she has a trademark but that's the kind of intellectual property because you see what happens when you all heard it people still react that way but fast forward we had to decide what we wanted to do with the business and next one prepared me for that because when you're talking to people who have done things in a different way with your business it made me unafraid to do what i had to do but because of what happened with the business and our profits i had to make a decision who i continue the business and struggle this way, or do I protect the business so I can do something with it later? And to protect the business, I had to declare personal bankruptcy. And that was hard. I didn't even tell people that I was doing it in years. Because, you know, you look at me and you say, oh my God, you know, all that in the back. No. Uh -uh. 
I was really struggling with doing that. And then I talk about it in my new book because I couldn't even tell people that I had to do that in order to protect the intellectual property. There are two ways you can do bankruptcy. You can do Chapter 7, which is personal. You can do Chapter 11, which is a business bankruptcy. But somebody else could have come along and taken all my assets and brought them for $0.50 cents a dollar, and they would own Comfort Cake and the trademark. And I did not want to do that. Because I did the research and I said, this is the best way for me to hold on to my assets that I can have later. And the story is still being told. I can't even tell you who I'm licensing my stuff to now because we're under non disclosure agreement. But trust me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is a, and you know what, and that's an example of how you play the long game, you know, that, that it, when you realize what you actually have that is of value. And a lot of times we don't, we miss it because the things that are valuable to us are different to our customers. Uh, Jimmy and Kamal, do you have anything to add to this about how your business model may have changed or changed or evolved through uh, your experience or since next one? I would say when I first started FS in 2008, I was working a full time job. I was working with Pfizer Pharmacy. I actually started in 05. I started in 05. We got an indoor space in 08. I was working a full time job for Pfizer Pharmacy. Uh, and I didn't quit my job until January 27, which is when we shipped to Um And you know, I started as a for profit. So we were, you know, opened up on 47th and the Park. You know, we were charging kids fifteen dollars an hour for tennis lessons, right? And it was bringing a lot of revenue, but it wasn't about net net revenue, right? So you know, revenue is just profit. Next one, like two million dollars, twenty grand net, right? Yeah. Uh, and so then, I'm like, yeah, that's not a job, right? So, yeah. Yeah. So, anyway, um, there's also a nine percent user tax. On every tennis court, I don't know if people don't know that. You run a tennis court at Midtown or Access, they take 9%. Right? And at the time, we were leasing the facility on 47. Uh, so we had to pay real estate taxes, but we built a new one. And they had to pay real estate taxes. So then I actually switched Access from uh, a for profit to a non profit. Because I was like, well, this is the thing, we're making the money. We get rid of the 9% user tax, we get rid of future real estate taxes on 13 acres. You know, then maybe this thing can have some life. Because I, again, I, even to this day, I've never collected this out of the collection. So if your, your kids go there, you want to give me a complaint, I don't want to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you know, it was kind of like, you know, in order for this to survive, then it needs to be a non -profit. You know, I remember when we were meeting with general contractors, I'm meeting with Jimmy, I'm like, Jimmy, you know, we got to bring the numbers down. I don't make money off this. I know you think I make money off this, but I, you know, we can't do this for this amount, right? Um, and so I converted from a for profit to a non profit. And we started looking at, you know, revenue versus profit. Um, and that was a result of, you know, next one people, oh, wow, you know, looks good, profit, profit. So um, that's sort of how this program made me rethink um, what I did. Right? And then also, you know, I think one of the, the push and pull in the firm, like, you know, you could, you could make. It would be better if you quit your job. You don't want to focus on the work, you know, and that's more time. But like you said, you know, you said, like that balancing act, like you know, so either insurance, or I thought the golden handcuff, like, right? Where you have to cry, insurance, all that stuff. Um, and then in 27, so 20, 2015, I was starting to travel more than my professional work. I was on TV more, so I was unable to like fake work. Right. You know, I had to do a real thing. The day I quit my job, I was coaching a kid from, from Chicago. He was going to play Caroline Wolfe Action, who was number one in the world. And they watched Serena Press. Right? Yeah. Serena took those two years off. Then yeah. Caroline Wolfe Action was number one in the world. So my, my kid was going to play her. First match on ESP, and I was on two of them. All we do, we sit knocking about people on my TV, you know, while the doctor's about to get it. But I, you know, I use all my vacation days from January 1 to January 27. I only get four weeks. Right? Oh, I, like, I had to call my boss and was like, yo, the tennis thing is going to work out. Um, <laughs> you know, we had just broke ground, we just made all the money from the facility, so I'm a quick. He's like, 
you know, you're in numbers class, and you're in and keep on your thing, I'll cover it, right? I was like, nah, I'm like really about to like be on TV. <laughs> <laughs> right? So it helped me sort of like sort of rethink, you know, whether it be for profit, non profit, you know. It, it challenged me to, you know, maybe sort of play more tug of war with when do I feel if I can afford to live. Wow. That's some good stuff, man. And thank you for making us laugh at, <laughs> in <laughs> our <laughs> I feel like I'm missing the party not being there physically. All right. The, here's our last question for you. Um, and and it's what you would say to the uh, new cohort of 10 business owners that have joined Next One for the next nine months. Um, what advice would you offer them to get the most out of the program? And um, what, what about it that you maybe wish you knew before you go went into it that you want them to know from the very beginning? And since nobody's jumping ahead at it, let's start with you, Jimmy. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> So I think uh, 20 years now, I think business is a journey, just like last year. At, at any given stage, you're learning something new. And I think over 20 years of doing this, we were just talking about it. It hasn't gotten any easier, uh, which is not the, what, what some folks would want to hear. Well, I believe we have people who not for me to have some kind of hope. If someone else is figuring out how to get in here, they're great to teach me that so I can take that class there. Uh, but I think you're learning something every every phase of this journey, right? So it might be marketing in one journey, it might be finance on the other one, it might be HR, it might be just learning how to treat them and be a better person or be a better spouse and just be a better citizen, right? So you're always evolving. For me, when I was coming into the next one, it was financial. Before then, I was all numbers. We make money, you know, PL, PNL, PNL. Then I started to realize that you gotta look at the balance sheet too. And, and really spend some time in understanding what equity is and what risk is. And, and that was the phase I was in at that particular time. And I was able to get plenty of value from that. But, but I think. If you think you're going to learn everything at the same time and there's this magic bullet out there, I, I don't know. It's just never worked for me. It's, it's, to be, it's, it's to be conscious, to be present, to, to be able to experience what you're learning, and to know what you're looking for. What, what stage are you in? Right? What are you trying to do? What, what is your next phase? What's stopping you from getting there? Uh, the most amazing thing, and I think tomorrow will open up with this, and it's going to work for me, is we work 12 hours a day on the job and we just work the job. I tell people all the time, I said, you got to call me before 10, but then time after 10, I'm dealing with the problem of the day. So I can't promise you I'm going to, any, any meeting after 10, I'm going to make it. Nine out of 10, I'm canceling that meeting. You got to call, you know, you don't have a meeting. You got to be before 10 because of all the problems that's coming up. So in business, what next one that you did, what that me did is I just stopped worrying about my day and I was planning for the business. And for the parts that I really wanted to improve on for those nine months, I did a really good job improving those aspects. And that's why it worked. And that's why. Wonderful. I love that. I love all those nuggets. And you're right. There is no such thing as a magic bullet. I sure wish there was, though. Uh, next, <laughs> let's hear from you, Amy. Um, what what advice would you give to the new cohort? Well, what I would say is when you are here with next one, really understand why. What is your why? What is your why? Because in business, as Jimmy and all of us have said, it's going to be a journey. It's going to, you're going to have challenges. You're going to have highs. You're going to have lows. You've got to understand what is your purpose for doing it. Because your purpose has to really be very front and center. You know, I've got 10 pivot points in my book. And the first pivot point is finding your purpose. Because if you don't have that purpose front and center, when all these other things are happening, you will start saying, why am I doing this? And I'm going home, I'm going to go get that job. You know, I, I'm going to give you a quote from Chadwick Boseman, who 
you know, spoke at Howard University um, in 2018, gave a commencement address, and he's a Howard alum as well. And, you know, he said, purpose crosses discipline. So whatever business you're in, purpose will cross it. Purpose is an essential element of you. It is the reason you are on the planet at this particular time in history. Think about that. That's why you're here. Think about, and for me, the Urban League is part of the history of entrepreneurship in Chicago. Chicago has a rich history of Black entrepreneurship. That's where I felt, you know, when I was coming to the Urban League the next one. I felt I was part of that entrepreneurial history of Chicago. And I knew for a comfort cake, whatever it would do, how I was going to take it as far as I could take it. But part of my purpose was that I would be able to show somebody else who's interested in food that if I could do it, they could do it too. And that drove me. So I would just say to all of you, understand your why. Why are you doing this? And it's got to be more than just making money for me. That's what it's got to be more than that because there's going to be times when you're not going to be making money and you still have to get up every day. And learn what you can. Never stop learning. You're never going to learn it all. You're never going to know it all. And you've got so many avenues of that you can just absorb learning from and just stay open and flexible with yourself. Love all also, of that. Absolutely. Have a big intention with your coaching. What? So, like her, Henderson, Karen Carter, Karen Taylor, they invited us to a barbecue. I started, you know, actually digging in, going and talking to them. Uh, I started talking to them as I was driving, like I always do. I don't take any phone calls when I'm in my physical home. I do all my talking in the car. I would just call them randomly. Like, yo, let me tell you what this phone call did. And that kind of thing, right? <laughs> and I would just, like, and talk about, they just got to talk about your business. With somebody outside your business, and I'm going to talk about the people in your business. Yeah. You're talking about them, right? <laughs> and then through that process, you know, you start, you know, they start to help you problem solve. You know what I mean? So I like really developed genuine friendships to this day. You know, and I would just call and they don't answer, they don't answer, text me, call me back then. Right, that's when I start venting, and then they help you figure out problems in between the sessions. And then I think the second point is to be vulnerable. You know what I mean? You know, we got a lead, we got. You know, yeah. this dude I pay him on Friday, he never shows up work on Saturday. Like, well, they should on Saturday. Mess up his check on Saturday. You know, that kind of thing. Right? <laughs> you know, that, I mean, you know, like being vulnerable about what the issues are so that you can get some real solutions. You know, I think sometimes when I first started the program, it's like, yo, let me show them my business check and got all the pins. And that, that ain't no check in his home. Right? You know what I mean? You know, like, oh, I'm going to contest, I'm going to get a grant. And everybody else, not, nah, not. Nah. It's like the benefit of the program is to be straight up. Be vulnerable so they can help you find solutions. Um, and then, but call them. Forget about daytime. You know, I got a problem right now. We will call, right? You know what I mean? I think that that was sort of how I got the most out of the whole thing. Not trying to pretend like I'm hurt. Uh, but my business is like who's running and who's like, no HR issues. Like, 30 employees and 25 of them are problems. You know what I mean? And then you start to like, you know, you know, fix, you know what I mean, or, you know, infrastructure issues or accounting issues, right? Um, and then, you know, call them and talk about it. You know, sometimes I think you need to like talk to them, you know what I mean, about the business that you can trust. You know what I mean? And I think, you know, I value discretion more than anything else. You know what I mean? And so I found, you know, two or three people that, you know, I can say that I'm still trusted with that. And JT will give you the last word on this one. Okay, well, how do I follow all these words? Um, I'm going to echo you. I'll start by saying, as I did in my introduction, um, about being present. We are very busy as entrepreneurs, but I think for the program, be present and be sociable, uh, which is akin to uh, you know, being humble, being open, uh, and vulnerable. Um, and open your mouth and talk about what you need and um, what you do. So this wonderful young woman in the front who's one of your cohort participants, she just started talking at the table and she's talking about starting a niche in her business to market in the cannabis business. I was like, hey, 
I have a cannabis business and we're building a program at the end. Um, the equity and justice in action um, contact that is focused on building anti businesses to serve the large cannabis business. There's a lot of money being made in cannabis, and we need to be at the table giving those contracts. So that can change between the two of us. We're hopefully getting to some contracts. You see how that works? Just like with the, you know, with the video at the beginning, the enterprise team and the being ready. So I would say be open, be humble, be present, be coachable, and be ready. Be ready for the success and the acceleration that that's one is going to bring to your business. Thank you all so much for sharing your wisdom. Wait, wait, did somebody, I'm getting an echo, so I'm not sure if somebody else is talking or, or what have you. So I apologize if I interrupted anyone. So I think we're good. I just wanted to thank all of you. Uh, Jimmy, Amy, Kamal, and JT, we appreciate you for participating today and sharing your experience and your success with Next One. And at this time, I'll now turn it over to our fearless leader, Chicago Urban League President and CEO, Karen Freeman Wilson. She is joined by noted historian and Pulitzer Prize winning author of On Juneteenth, Annette Gordon-Reed. That is a, the conversation of that is part of our featured presentation today. Happy Juneteenth. It's been an honor to be part of uh, this program. Karen, thank you so much for the work you and the, and the Chicago Urban League uh, put into our city and our business owners. Uh, we appreciate you. Thank you. And Jane, before you go, please join me in thanking Dean Sparrow for being an amazing moderator. The support that you give to the Chicago Urban League.